Hey, what's good everyone? My name is MG The Future. Today's video, I'm taking it easy. It's more of a PSA. Um, I'm not gonna dive into any crazy theory or anything like that, but I do just wanna talk to you guys about some ideas and discussions I've been having on Twitter. Actually today, Twitter, I just went on like a little tirade of making a bunch of posts and I was getting a lot of engagement. I was getting some DMs and stuff and people asking me questions. One person on Twitter was like, yo, you should do a discussion about this. And I think what I was saying was about the phasing out of Metro Boomin. You should do a video on this for real, right? But let me give you a brief synopsis of what it was that I was talking about. Essentially, what I was seeing and noticing on Instagram and on Twitter, people were sh sharing these stories, uh, like little one minute clips of interviews. I believe it's from Producers Grind. There's this brother interviewing these different producers. And I have no problem with these particular producers. I think I was having a problem with the captions because a lot of the captions and comments were saying like, yo, this answer or this moment is the key that you need to find success or something like that. And I honestly don't believe that. And it, it is not a new phenomenon. I mean, I've heard this stuff coming up because I started when I was like 15, 16 years old. So we always had the older heads kind of shape us and mold us and tell us what the rules are, what the unspoken rules of engagement were for being successful as a producer or selling beats. And I have a very unique point of view and experience because when I started selling beats online wasn't as common. It wasn't, everyone wasn't doing it. You weren't worrying about people undercutting prices. In fact, you're worrying about raising your prices, right? So it's a whole different phenomenon and a whole different set of rules to get to that level to, to earn that kind of money or potential or placement or whatever it was. We were actually never chasing placements too, which is a whole nother conversation. However, um, the context of these interviews is that people are saying, yo, the keys to success is like working hard. It's, you know, staying focused. It's like getting out of the house and meeting people and all these things. And I simply disagree with most of them because it's going to be depending on who you are. Getting out the house and meeting people means beat battles. It means open mics. It means physical networking. The problem with that today is that to network physically Back then meant you had a CD or cassette tape on you and people could listen to it, buy it, and you can do a form of exchange or marketplace on the spot. Now you gotta carry around USB sticks and those are kind of expensive. Or you have to pass out a business card with a code on it, show them your website or point them to iTunes. There's a lot of awkward buffer or you know filler in the way for you to actually get someone to consume your music in person using the old strategy. When the new strategy is probably much simpler and you actually don't have to network physically. I'm not saying don't network physically. I'm just saying that is not the key to how people are successful today in today's market. Um, the key to success in anything that you do is really simply put attention. Going to the beat battle and winning would give you some kind of attention. I've won beat battles, got a little of attention, but I got more people asking me about what I use and what the drums and samples are than an actual favor to go to the next level. Um, I've been to networking events. I've been to things hosted by celebrities. All this is a cash money grab and the opportunity for you to meet other people in your area who are just as hungry as you are. So the fringe benefit of going is to meet like-minded folks, not necessarily the event itself. And that is the psychology a lot of producers are using to invite you to camps and stuff and, you know, to play your music in front of people. It's not about the experience of meeting the person that's hosting. It's about the experience of meeting the people you would be surrounded by. But you already do that online. You do that with your followers on Instagram. You do that with your followers on Twitter. I do it with you guys on YouTube. All I gotta do is create dialogue and engage with you where you are. We don't have to ever meet in that kind of context. So I was trying to think, why am I, re why am I reacting so negatively to these things? Because they're not bad ideas. And I think the reality is they're just dated ideas or they're misdirections on the opposite side of the spectrum. I feel like they're misdirecting people because they're not giving appropriate context. And it's my fault for taking it personal because it's only a one minute clip. You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to spice together all these clips together and watch different parts of the interview to get and read between the lines of what they're really saying. Unfortunately to me, for, unfortunately for a person like me, I've always seen through the BS. Like I said in an old discussion, I've seen the sound click era um, when all my people stopped using it and the new kids were using it and the sound click plays increaser, increaser bot was out for $75 and you pay it. You load your profile, you hit play, and it sends all these plays. 
everyone kind of like, yo, it didn't exist, but if you're benefiting from it, you would have to deny its existence. There's a phenomenon about that where people um, will will believe a person who's untrustworthy more until they get out of hand or blatantly obvious. So the plausible deniability protected a lot of producers, and then you become a, a villain or a hater for exposing the fact that this thing exists and it works. And these people were using it. <laughs> and on certain forums, they noticed uh, Team Hits had a falling out because one producer was uh, accusing the other producer for freezing their page for sending them too many plays. Because SoundClick was at least uh, in tune with their data enough to know that, you know, if a person got 100,000 clicks or plays in an hour for the same three beats, that is not organic. So they would freeze those pages and investigate it when they noticed that kind of uptick in traffic. And the reason why this is happening is because that traffic would catapult your beat to number one on the chart, which then would attract organic traffic of people looking at the charts, which then would increase your chances of selling beats. And many of the producers have used this gimmick to uh, chart and, and, and sell beats and get a name for themselves, which is hustling for attention. It's probably not really a problem with that, but I just want to point out how they did it. Uh, and then the prices on SoundClick ads for people who didn't know about this hustle they were charging everyone else $500 to be on the front page to compete with the something that wasn't real. And this kind of thing happens in the industry. That's when all the debates about payola was happening. That's why Ebro in the morning gets offended when someone asks him about that. And everyone kind of prides themselves on picking their own playlist, although their playlist is the same as all the other sister stations. So there's there's this there's this benefit from hiding the secret or the con. And I understand it. It's human nature. My problem is I do not respect when people regurgitate that and then pass it on to people and then there's no results. And there's no results because that actually doesn't work. So when you see some of these producers who capitalize off of other producers, and you know, I'm not holier than thou in a way because I'm hustling for your attention by making these videos, right? Um, if I had the right title, it would be called clickbait. But what what I'm saying is if there's no results in the, in the work order, like if a producer is selling you this thing or opportunity or vision to help you get to the next level because the person above you should be reaching down to pull you up. If that producer you've seen win the contest or impress that person doesn't get an opportunity that pans out to anything more than what they would have done on their own, then what was it good for? What are they actually teaching? What was the impact of the message? or of the private meeting, or the phone call, or the hanging out in the studio? What did it really prosper besides a video on YouTube with 10,000 plays? Th those are the kind of things that stand out to me because you notice it continuously. It's the same hustle and con, and you know, it is what it is, I'm a hater. That's what it is, I'm a hater. I I'm hating on it because it's 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 wrong. It's It's not how you do any of this, but anyway, I say that to say the, the human dynamic, the psychology of a consumer, the psychology of an American, the psychology of the Western world is very fragmented. And there are certain things that you can do that will attract people that will become very formulaic that have certain results. There's a lot of big data being traded with us with social media. And, you know, we did all those EEU agreements agree to take your cookies and all this stuff, all the websites updated because the data and the patterns are real. However, if you don't have access to that data or those patterns, everyone's guessing what it means. What I'm going to tell you is that you buy ads, not so much for the impact, you buy ads to experiment with the data. They charge you for ads so you get access to this data. And I hate that they only give you a limited view, but as I run ads on Instagram and other platforms legitimately, I start to see like this web. And this web is really huge. The more money you have, the bigger it is. And I think the more money you put into it, the more tools they give you too. They just don't say that on the surface because it would look like a light and a pro version of the software. When it is, they just don't want to market it that way. But the, the numbers really don't lie. What I mean is, as long as whatever you're doing and however you're doing it hits a certain critical mass of num numeric attention, views, plays, stats, sales, whatever the number is, 
that number has such a psychological influence on everyone else that it will lure people in organically for you. So even if the brothers were hacking SoundClick, they did inevitably sell real beats and become really popular by real people because of the mere influence of being on number one, equaling 150,000 plays a day on a site that never got that much traffic a day. Um, it was about the number, not the approach. So I guess that's why I really can't judge anyone for it, for cheating or hacking or manipulating. Um, my thing is when they lie and hide behind hard work. <laughs> that, that I'm more of a justice type person. You know, I'm like an INFJ, INTJ. So I'm very judgmental of how people lie or, or, or hide certain or withdraw or withhold certain pieces of information. And it just doesn't make me feel good because it makes it feel like the upper class versus the lower class and that you guys are too stupid to understand. It's really not them protecting their monopoly or their market. It's, it's a sense of arrogance and narcissism over you. It's like it's a form of gaslighting. Let's keep it real. And, and I see it happen all the time. So when people share these stories with me, I get more and more frustrated. And that's when I do these Twitter rants. But for you, <laughs> for you who are just learning and having fun and things like that, you know, I don't want to bog you down with that kind of stuff. I just want you to stay woke and be aware um, that part of these talking points that you see and part of these interviews and podcasts that you see is marketing to manipulate you further. And I'm guilty of it on certain levels too. So I'm not above or beyond it, but I want you to be aware of it and so that you could filter it to get what you actually want. And that's what you want. Even if someone <laughs> has an advantage or has something, or you like you have to pay for a service or something, even if that's the case, I just think it should be fair that you get something in return from them. I guess that's what I'm saying. Everyone's being used. Everyone's using everyone but it's the fair exchange. I don't want you paying me for this secret, you know, uh, trade secrets. And then when you're done with this program or video or thing, you come out not knowing any more, more than what you did going in or that you don't feel like you can't approach something because when you rest and sleep it off, you realize, yo, the heck were they talking about? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that's how I felt. And a lot of selling beats courses and PDFs came out that were exactly like that. They're repackaging email marketing for producers and people th thought that's how you sell beats online. And it wasn't. That was like how you sell websites and use uh, landing pages and squeeze pages and stuff. That was all internet marketing from 1999 repackaged for producers. It was an ingenious con, but it wasn't really how the market of rappers worked because most people uh, spam things and get rid of stuff. And a lot of people in the urban culture don't have a high tolerance um, for a lot of wordy things. So it's very curious when you factor in classism and races and different cultures and stuff. So with the hip hop culture and the music culture, our whole thing is we have a sigil or we hold a light towards people who appear to be successful and closer to the light. And what I mean is a producer becomes hot because they have a hot song on radio. So when an artist comes, a label signs an artist, works with a production team and a writing team, puts a song out, penetrates the billboard, Spotify playlist, SoundCloud, YouTube ads, radio in your car. At that moment, when that all manifests correctly, the conversation naturally becomes, well, who produced it? That's our culture. Our culture is who produced the hot song or the song that's being played all the time. And then you look into that producer, follow them on social media, other outlets do the same thing. Blogs try to get a great story by interviewing them first. Um, the genius websites and the reconstructed tech videos occur with this producer. And then you start to see the attention form around them. And then they become a star or, or garner a certain amount of attention that you think they did more or had something else that you didn't have. The difference is the machine behind the hit song, not the producer or beat of the hit song. And that's the part where people get lost. Because when you watch the deconstruct it, you'd be like, yo, I could do that. Which is true, you can. Because when you see the interview and they're answering questions they don't have good answers, you'd be like, I, I could answer that better because you can. So <laughs> the mystery that you're trying to figure out isn't necessarily musical talent or skill wise. It is how do you penetrate the, the mechanism or the machine that gives you attention? And since you don't have a label deal or a production deal or uncle or cousin or friend or whoever to walk you through that line to be part of that 
system, which is less about the producer and more about the label, if you look at the numbers, then you will never have it. So the trick is to take that same formula, which everyone's memeing lately, independence and stuff like that, and then apply it to yourself in what you're doing. If you're a beat maker and you need more attention, you have to think about who you're getting attention from. Are you actually getting attention from rappers or are you getting attention from other producers? Here's my story. I've always been active on producer forums. When I interacted with the rapper forums, I noticed my way of thinking, being analytical, technical, and critical, wasn't appreciated as much. They're all jokes. Rappers are really funny. <laughs> People who rap and do songs are very into sports. They're into jokes. They're into women. They're into a lot of vain things. Of course, it matches the lyrics of the music. So me being a more technical, mental person, I didn't connect with too many rappers on, on, on a social construct within the forums, right? But I peeped game when I jumped into the producers' forums and I engaged not in the music posting, but in the conversations about plugins, VSTs, drum kits, theorizing what made Dr. Dre and Timberland hot. I noticed my engagement was stronger. My, my attention was stronger when I made those topics. When I did the clickbait forum post about, yo, uh, I'm better than Scott Storch or something like Ozone used to do. You notice there is a critical engagement of other producers. So learning that lesson or experiencing that as a 15, 16 year old, it made sense 15, 16 years later that I'm on YouTube pretty much using that same formula. You know, I talk about the hottest music theory tools, the hottest sounds, the hottest mixing plugins, the easiest way to do things, demystifying the magic of certain songs. All these things that I do is just a continuation of what I got attention from. And it works here too. I'm getting attention for doing the same thing. So if you're trying to sell beats, you don't actually want to penetrate me or my market or other people within our market. You don't want to reach out to a whole bunch of people who overly think critically and analyze and build and create things to just to break them down again. You want to penetrate popular culture or mainstream mind state. And depending on how you're wired, that might be hard to do. That's why people get managers and representatives or they team up with other producers who are a little bit charis charismatic or a little bit of a narcissist because you kind of need that if you want to penetrate that market or at least be in touch with it so you can do your ads correctly. So that's why when people post tight beats on YouTube, they have the picture of the artist or the girl or the car and it's a certain color scheme. Um, that's why the keywords in their videos is a certain thing or a certain way. Um, that's why the titles are a certain way is because it's speaking to that crowd of people, not to someone like me, right? You know, it's not, it's not named the iMac 5k type beat. Listen to this while you're watching uh, hero academia, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's not working that way in lo-fi. It does though. Lo-fi targets the anime crowd a whole lot, but you'll notice the anime crowd has some polarity. You have some people who are really, really weird and depressed or just strange or you have people who are a little bit nerdy or geeky or more intelligent in a traditional sense so you got to tap into who you are first of all first of all you got to be real with yourself that's what that means and by identifying which one of those people you are that's how you penetrate that market because you start to pay attention to it remember how they say like you know follow your dreams what that means is creating a roadmap based on what your interests are you, you, tr you just translate the, the, the catchphrase is cool, but it doesn't mean anything. Follow your dreams just means, yo, if you want to be like this person, literally follow them. Watch what they do. Become, you know, try to become, get them to be your mentor or something. And you can do that virtually now. Um, look at the producers you look up to or make the kind of sound that you like, that you really like. And look at them. What do they post? What do they talk about that's off of music? Can you penetrate that? Do they talk about a certain sports team that you're a fan of? Can you engage in that conversation and uh, retweet it and add value to that conversation and then attract the other people following them who are also similar minded, who will inevitably follow you? You know what I mean? Like that's the following your dreams part. Um, even the same thing with their fashion and the tattoos on the face and the tattoos on arms. I don't make beats for people who put tattoos on their face. I know that. I make beats for little light skinned girls from London. <laughs> LMA, <laughs> but, but if you, if you, but if you could really understand that and think about that, if I want to get a placement with LMA or Georgia Smith or these girls from London for real, 
who are redoing 90s R&B, Aaliyah-esque type stuff, I'm going to have to really tap into their culture and what makes them tick and pulse from their fashion, from their sensibilities and their who they look up to. You know, it's always Beyonce and Stevie Wonder. You have to, this is what we call the fake it till you make it, penetrate that meme because it all goes together. Everything feeds into together. A lot of these producers who are established want to admit the fact that they came up entering beat battles with their fake Mob Deep and Pete Rock type beats. The reason why it didn't sound like Pete Rock is because they didn't know how to sound like Pete Rock. But the actual creation of what they were doing was to be like Pete Rock or DJ Premier. If we kept it 100, most people can't afford to keep it 100 because it'll make them look some kind of way. But that's the truth. It's just everyone's like that. You know, Timbaland was like Devontae Swing and Teddy Riley. Pharrell the same way. They all say Sade was their favorite R&B artist or whatever. Well, if you listen to some of her music that wasn't a popular music, you hear the in and out of key chord progressions all the time. Whether it's Dorian or Dominant This, I don't know. But that's what their influence was. And they took it and ran with it and added modern drums. So, so keep this stuff really simple and practical and really approach. You don't, you don't have to aim for the person who you think is at the top because they're usually not. You need to aim for the people who are like you, first of all. Then once you do that, it, it'll just speak to you. Like unfollow everybody real quick, right? Or if you're on Twitter, make a list. Lists are dope. Make it a private list, too. And, like, in your list, pick the 5 to 20 people who you resonate with the most. Whether it's an actor, a sports figure, a producer, a rapper, a composer, a creative, an architect. And I want you to focus on that list of people. And just consume what they're sharing and what they're retweeting or what they're posting. And then check them off and make sure you still have those interests. And once you tap into that kind of zeitgeist and you can see what the, where that energy or heat map is, then you can start seeing the comments and the people and you realize what other types of people are attracted to the same thing. And then you understand when you run that Instagram ad, who are the people you are targeting? When you run that Facebook ad, what kind of graphics work? Because your brain's always seeing those graphics already. It's really easy in that sense. The hard part is the time that it takes to formulate this plan, this plot, this list. And then something remarkable happens almost always. Someone else is going to notice what you're doing and then help you a step further. Or you're going to start getting DMs about from certain types of people who you overlook as a aid or a building block. But they really are. They're just connecting to you on one asset. But if you speak to them long enough, you realize that they're really there to help you with another asset or something else that you're working on that they have the strength in. It's how teams and bonds are formed, right? And and I think most people overlook that when they start spamming beats for sale and five beats for 99 cents and just emailing everyone or just posting a whole bunch of beats on the internet. They lose the fact that this is a human-based experience and what you're really fighting for is attention for people like you. You're trying to win your attention your spirit energy, your soul group, your group think. You're trying to impress them. And within your group, you have the millionaires like you, you have the business execs like you, and then they elevate you at some point if you penetrate, pause, and then you become a mainstream or cast a wider net. You know, people with overlapping similarities that belong to other groups. If you think of it like the circle of fifths, ah, I love this, this actually makes sense. I just, I invented this. Y'all can keep this if you want. <laughs> so let's imagine you're C major, right? You're at the top of this chart. You're C major. Um, and C major likes beats. He likes F, who likes anime, who likes basketball, who likes foreign women, who likes fast cars or foreign dudes. And you like Italian food, right? What happens is you're trying to penetrate your circle of fifths. You're trying to penetrate your scale of types of people and interest that you have. This is your list that you're following or types of people you're following. What happens is the people over here, once they resonate with you and you have their attention and their influence or their favor, they can introduce you to the people over here, which is right next to them, which is D major. D major shares a lot in common with G and E, but then three other groups of people. Those two groups of people that overlap you end up learning those interests. You end up learning those type of things. 
but D has to do the same thing. So by the relationship of this slice in the middle, G will connect you C to D and so on and so forth. You know, and you get people like Michael Jackson who, who might penetrate half the, the pie slice. No matter how many records he sold, he still failed because he didn't sell records to everybody. But he sold records to a whole bunch of people. He might just have this whole slice here. The thing is, we're over here looking up the people down here trying to emulate the shit that's down here. That's not us. It's not who we are. It's not the harmony we're in. It's not the group that we're in. It's it's not, not, We got to fake some of this. You know, just because it's an E doesn't mean it's an E flat. You feel me? So that's why some people come off the wrong way or you just, I don't resonate with their energy because I know they're an E flat pretending to be an E minor, right? So <laughs> it's crazy how you could see it. You see it better that way. And, and that's what I'm really trying to explain. Um, on the music side, though, the getting better and the, uh, and the advancing and having a product or something that would be worth the attention, right? Because once you have the attention, you actually want to impress people and have people remember you and, and, and just bring your name up in conversation or check back up with you later for new things. That just comes from time. And it doesn't take a long time in beat making. It takes a year or two. The thing is, once you get to a year or two of practicing your craft, if you don't see results or you're not growing or expanding into new sounds or uh, completing your visions, you're going to inevitably get stuck. So for a person like me, I had to do new things. Like once I really figured out how to do sample based beats, when I got stuck, I switched over to the Southern stuff. Back then we called it Dirty South Music because Although I wasn't making those beats, I had an affinity for the sounds they were using. So it was easy for me to learn how to compose that style of music because it's the sounds I resonated with because it was the only VSTs I can get. And that repeats and that transformed to other stuff. Then you get into R&B and then you get think about chord progressions more, melodies more. And then you realize, you know, I really need to make better bass lines. And then the culture changes from bass lines to 808s. And then you got to learn that. So if you've been making music for a long time and you mastered the old skill set for that time, update your time, update what you're listening to and um, switch out the sounds and stick to the new stuff, divorce the old stuff, let it go. That window of opportunity passed went and went on. Very few people, though, can <laughs> do the old style and get a hit today. It happens every once in a while. You'll notice what Bruno Mars uh when he was doing the living color type beats and stuff with Cardi B. Those producers are modern producers though, but they had the skill set from back in the day to bring that now. But when you're actively promoting yourself, try to be contemporary. And that was one of the other big questions I got on Twitter about type beats and stuff like that. This is what I would do. And I've showed you guys this before. Um, I would use mixed in key or similar, whatever gives you charts and information. It doesn't matter what it is. I would go to SoundCloud, SoundClick, YouTube Playlist, whatever, and download everything. Don't ask me how. There's websites and converters and Google Chrome add-ons. You could grab all this stuff. So me, I have Quickly Quickly that I did recently who does lo-fi. I'm not interested in his sound that much, but I am interested in his arrangement. So I have that. I have Frankie Urban Inspiration. Actually, a friend sent this to me because DJ Frank E., I think they sent this to DJ Frank E as inspiration for making records when Frank E had some placements a couple years ago. I saw the SoundCloud or the, uh, the, the what is that called? Cloud down, download something. You know what I'm talking about. You share all those links that never worked for me. But anyway, it was in my cloud thing. And I downloaded it again just to look at the songs they were studying. I was like, oh, that's an interesting collection of songs from that time period, which was 2010 to 2013. So this is about five years old. And then I have Amir Obi. Amir Obi was supposed to be Drake before Drake came out. Amir Obi raps really well, and he really sings and stacks vocals. And he has his own in-house producer by the name of Niles from Detroit, who's a prolific producer, who's done everything Boy Wonder and all of them were doing before they were doing it. The problem is no one knows and no one really cares. He was Phantom Freshy before, he was signed to Atlantic, but I knew him before that on MySpace. And for whatever reason, he just never really popped off. Um, but I still like his music. And I know that Drake and those type of artists are borrowing from him. And Party Next Door is bar borrowing from him. So knowing that, 
and me being able to see the future of my tribe or my sound or what I'm attracted to, I'll just put that into mixed in key and I'll let it analyze these songs. And what I would do is go through this, add a new collection, and then drag out my favorite songs. Once I dragged out my top five favorites, I would start looking at things very seriously. I would go, all right, my favorite songs that they do, what energy is it? It's probably in the sixes, right? Then I look at who produced it. Well, it's usually Niles. Then I look at the tempos, 140 to 160. You can find a median maybe. Then I look at the keys, a lot of 11 A's, right? Like this stuff ain't rocket science. You can easily figure that out. So a lot of this stuff is 11A. What is 11A? 11A is F sharp minor. And then you start taking notes like that. You'll start taking notes of the tempos that are mostly used a lot. So things over 140. So 142 to 148, right? It, and by miraculousness, you'll figure it out. So if I ever met an, an Amir Obi himself, or artists that reminds me of him, or I'm trying to attract artists like him, because just like there's producers who do type beats, there's rappers and singers who are the same way. They look at each other for harmonies and verses and words and openers all the time. It's conversations I watch people do it. But um, it's not as taboo because they're not as public about their creative process. But anyway, y you learn so much from it. And then of course you can, you can play it in here. And you can skip through the cue marks and figure out what the hook, what made the hook different than the verse and all these things, make these notes and then create with intention like that and get better at doing that. And then when you're done with your Amir Obi playlist, go on to the next one and do the same thing. Your uh, creativity never really runs out because there's so many different people here on this planet creating at all times. So I just never understand what the creative hangup is. And I think it's because of the lies that those people were telling us about finding your own sound and style and these hoops you have to jump through to be prolific. Because here's the reality. No matter if I pick the right chords in the chord progression, the same drum samples, the same arrangement, the same tempo, the same everything, it's still going to sound like I did it. Because that's one thing that people don't really talk about. Most people who do type beats or copy beats very rarely sound better than the original. Let's keep it honest. And then two, the amount of time it takes to make it exactly the same, finding that same string or same bass tone um, is usually a waste of time. So you just changing three things, a different hi-hat at a different pattern, uh, the wrong chord progression, but in the same key, and then a different drum or kick pattern, just changing that movement changes the vibe of what you created anyway. It becomes an original work. There's a word for it, though. It's called cryptonesia. <laughs> cryptonesia. This occurs when a forgotten memory returns without it being recognized as such by the subject, who believes it is something new and original. It is a memory bias where a person may falsely recall generating a thought or an idea or a tune or a joke, not deliberately engaging in plagiarism, but rather experiencing a memory as if it were a new inspiration. A lot of people who speak to us about originality forget that they have this problem. They have cryptonesia. Because I hear people talking about, you know, this original thing that they've done or this style, sound they landed on, and I'm like, but I hear all of your influences. I hear all of your original memories and what they're based off of. Just because they can't identify that this is what's happening doesn't mean it's not happening. And I, th I think people simplify the human experience way too much. We're really not that deep. Like, no, you didn't. None, none of you are creating anything from scratch. You're just forgetting where you got the influence from. What I'm doing is shortcutting all of that and saying, be intentional then. If it's, if it's an inevitable phenomenon, then go ahead and narrow in on your results so you can hurry up and be part of your tribe. That's it, man. It's really not deeper than that. The money, the success, and all that are the moves you make once you realize. Like if you have to buy ads, you're buying ads for C major and A minor, not these guys. When you're doing certain graphics and colors, you're looking for the colors that these people use. When you're looking for someone to buy beach, you're hitting up these guys who are talking about, you know, Naruto or something. I don't know. You're looking for these people in business, business leaders and technology leaders. You're looking for the business, the local business 
who's this guy? You know, if the guy that owns your studio is really into marijuana over here somewhere and you don't like smoking, then don't even don't even bother. Let B flat introduce you to him when the time is right, because he's going to disappoint you if you go directly to him acting like you have a connection. It's really a circle of fifths and your skill set outside of that, what you're doing and what you're offering to your tribe or your vibe or your circle is when you get really good at creating. And that's the part I'm helping you with. I'm helping you with the tools, the DAWs, the sounds, the kits, the loop packs, whatever you need to stop making excuses to get you to do stuff. And then once you do more stuff, whether you're sending it to Lander or not, whether you're mixing with Ozone or not, once you get more stuff made, more products made, more business cards made, and more websites and stuff, and you see these plays and views and comments and DMs start to happen to you, you're going to start noticing the next steps all on your own because it takes over you when you've really fully committed to the process. And it's happening to me in real time. And I could I could spend like 20 videos talking about all the mistakes I've made um, trying to be in someone else's circle or looking up to people who are just too many steps away from me and how that would never work. Not because the music wasn't there, but because the relationship or the, uh, the harmony wasn't there. There's a dissonant relationships. And, and it's cool though. And that's what they mean by not giving a F and not caring. If you don't get along with these dudes back here, that's cool. You gotta remember there's 7 billion people divided by 24. Get a million from D minor then, you feel me? And you gotta be okay with that. You gotta accept that maybe your niche or your crowd is a bunch of nerds. I have, hey guys. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that that's a good thing. That's where the peace comes from. That's where the happiness comes from. That sense of belonging, that feeling that void is you stop impressing the wrong people. You stop following the wrong advice. Um, and it is not bad or wrong or, or negative. It's just not for you. Recognize that and everything else is going to manifest for you. That I can promise you. The closer you get to your energy and the more focused you get on the, on the blaring signals <laughs> that are always talking to you, whether it's the posters on my wall, the video games down there, the turntable in front of me, the SP404 under me, the iPad in my hand, the 3D programs that I have, those similarities that brought you to me are the same similarities you're going to see in your actual audience and the people that are going to help you make it. Um, not everybody is your neighbor. I know a lot of people who uh, reference the Bible and stuff, which is really dope. But the mistake that most people make especially for my demographic, I can only speak from my personal experiences, is that they believe that everyone is their neighbor. And the circle of fifths show us that that's not true. You only have six groups of neighbor. Yourself, the guy on the left of you, the guy on the right of you, and the three below you. Those are your neighbors. Everybody ain't your neighbor. And in a literal way, everyone doesn't have your best interests. Everyone's not the perfect mate or companion. Everyone's not the perfect friend. And those small differences, no matter how close they are, are very big in terms of the results and impact they have on your life. And most of your disappointments come from following that. So I just wanna help you guys get super focused and give you some concepts and ideas to work on um, because that's just the time we're in. The technology is way too advanced. It's making this seem like there's no magic and there's no romance anymore. That's fine. While everyone else is crying about it and trying to figure it out and try to stabilize their emotional field because their tricks don't work against the technology or the new advances in technology, there's other ways to make it now. Just double down on it. Double down on the technology. Like I had someone else, someone made a comment that, you know, it's ironic that all these music theory tools, um, it'll be easier to learn music theory. And I was like, how? I don't get that. It wouldn't be easier at all. And that, like no, on no level. On easy keys, you literally drag and drop MIDI and hit apply and drag and drop it to a sound. You're done. Everything is harmonic. It's a clean chord progression. You can modify it and try things like I'm doing. I'm a little bit too ambitious for easy keys. Like literally easy keys comes with preset packs. You could just drag down, chop into four bars and choose play styles for itself. I never have to think about the key or chord progression if I didn't want to. So how is it easier to learn all that stuff from scratch? It doesn't make sense. Tracing on the piano roll, finding the root note that you marked across the top and then tracing the bass line and 
connecting keys and scale to be the passing notes. That's not easy to do by hand. When you're trying to do a whole composition from scratch and play it live, play it in time, play it fast enough, getting your fingers to actually fit on the keys. It's not easier. And that's because people don't understand technology. But all that says to me is I don't even have to explain myself to them. I just know. You're just on from a different part of the circle. That's all. And that's what I mean. I'm like, I have to take my own advice too. Like, I don't do videos for everybody. I do videos for my tribe. And a lot of people is like, yo, you should have way more subscribers or followers or impact. And the reality is I am not trying to impact everybody. Never was. In fact, I didn't even think I was going to get to 10,000 because I knew the things I was talking about was just a different paradigm. Like, I think about it different. I'm talking to a different group of people. And then you guys have seen examples of people above reach down to me and talk to me or retweet me and stuff like that because they recognize it too. But even still, they cross me over into other circles. But I'm still true to myself, and that's what that means. I'm still in my circle, my pie slice. This is what I'm about. It's MG, you know what I'm about. I'm not about to sit here and spend 20 years of piano lessons to play what I've been copying and pasting for two minutes. Never, ever, never. In fact, the, the more I learn the tools I have, the less like the less I want to play piano. In fact, I have this in front of me because my cord is not hooked up. You heard me say it in the video yesterday. I have no real reason to ever touch that keyboard outside of the fact I paid money for it and I should learn it and it would be a cool hobby of mine to practice these scales and learn how to play them myself. And I do time to time, but it's not my focus or my goal because my brain has connected all the music theory dots that I've been trying to learn by hand to the technology that explains it and shows it because I realize I'm a visual learner. You can't talk to me in harmonies and fifths and dominants and major thirds and minor seconds. It takes me a while to say, okay, I know what you're saying. It went from C to D sharp, but what does that mean? Whereas if I see it visually, okay, okay, so when this chord is next to this chord, it sounds like that. That's what I want to do. And I can do it now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's not for everybody. And it's going to be the same thing with your beats. You might make a whole bunch of stuff that's just dope to you and a few people. You might show it to somebody. It ain't for them. So your goal is to find other people who would like your stuff and to have enough self-awareness to know that you're doing it at the best level that your group of people listen to. If you can't compare your song to something else that you're inspired by and not have the advantage or have something close where you can go between it and the playlist and go, I'm not disappointed, <laughs> then you're not ready yet. So maybe it's not the tactics that are, are not getting you the results. You're just not ready for the results yet. And there's nothing wrong with that. Spend more time, double down, be more concentrated and focused on what you're preparing for and studying. And um, just go with the flow, man. I, I guess that's the end of my rant. That's the end of my YouTube rant. Um, I can't think of anything else that I mentioned on here. Everything else will be on Twitter. I'm just trying to see these comments if there's anything I missed. Yeah. Reggaeton. I said, you think the bros making reggaeton were beefing when the Dimbo loop was used a hundred times? That's why every producer kit is a pitched version of Lex Luger kit. So that's my last point. My last point is um, reggaeton is the, the best example of this. Reggaeton has three to four rhythms that it uses. The dembo loop, the one with the high sounding percussions, and the boom, tuk, tuk, boom, boom, tuk, tuk. and they'll alternate that. Or they'll use all four in the same beat sometimes. The group called Looney Tunes from Puerto Rico, who used to produce for Wiesen and Yandel, and uh, Don Omar, all of them actually. Those guys were prolific keyboard players and synth users, but their drums are always the same, always the same. And no one ever listened to reggaeton who's from that tribe and goes, we should change these drums up. An interesting thing has happened though in the last five years, reggaeton artists have come to America or similar, even Mexico artists, younger people, are now doing the same words, same lyrics, same style of music on top of trap drums. So trap impacted a different culture but when you listen to their trap drums they're you because they have the approach 
from reggaeton to reuse the rhythms and stuff they're doing the same thing with their trap beats their trap beats aren't changing and game changing or nothing like that they're functional and they're using the same textures the same polo snare the same rolls the same hi-hats it's an amazing thing to see a different culture do it because then you appreciate what we're fighting and arguing about is a fake argument and fight set up by gatekeepers who don't want you to keep going forward and figuring it out. Look at the other cultures. Look outside your culture and figure it out. When you listen to Afrobeat today, they're using the same drum kit. They're using the Lex Luger kit for Afrobeat. And they're doing the same things with a different bop, a different rhythm structure, but the same sounds. And it doesn't change. You can mix 50 new Afrobeat songs right into each other. I think they're even using the same key and scale. Like, it almost sounds like the same producer is doing all of it. But the difference is, is the voice, is the song, is the message, is how it makes you feel, how you resonate with it. It's not the production part. Um, so I guess what I'm really trying to say is don't overthink the production part so much. You're a producer or a beat maker, I get it. But re you really need to simplify it to the core elements that work for what you're trying to do and who you're trying to reach and repeat that enough time to send it out to enough people to wait for results back to get you to the next level. I don't know what that number is. It's different for other people. Some people upload every day, some do 100 at a time and sell as many as those as they can and when it's dried up, they'll do new ones. I don't know what the right answer is. But the wrong answer is trying to perfect one of them and then being mad at the world that no one cares about it. <laughs> That's all of us sometimes. So just keep that in mind. You know that Big Head Beats kit that I liked? It's just a pitched version of the uh, Lex Luger kit. That is a token kit that everyone's using. That snare and that claps in the Lex Luger kit too. The difference is the one signature 808 that he does where he changed that tack. Like I only know that because I spent so much time studying this stuff and experimenting. But now that I've learned it already and I look back on it, I go, damn, almost everything is the same when you're smart enough. And I don't mean that to, to insult nobody. When you're smart enough and you have enough of the information, knowledge is power, my people perish for lack of knowledge, when you have enough knowledge and you look backwards over your path, you go like, yo, I overthought a whole bunch of stuff because people weren't giving me real answers. They weren't making the connections or helping me see it clearly. They were giving me this grand wah thing to ascend to. Meanwhile, they were making all their checks being fake whoever's. Be good or be good at it. Until next time, peace.